Good evening. I think we have uh, most everybody up with us tonight. Uh, maybe a few more to come, but we, we should get going. My name is Mary McDonald. I'm the Senior Manager in Heritage Planning for the City of Toronto. I'm in the Urban Design section in City Planning. And I am so uh, pleased and honored to be hosting this evening, or to be uh, representing the City of Toronto as host for this evening lecture and uh, working with uh, the National Trust in preparing this guest lecture. So I, I just want to say that um, one of the things that I love about the National Trust Conference generally, and I see a lot of badges, so most of you are going to the conference, which is amazing. One of the things I love is it always offers an opportunity, and, and it's, it's not by accident. It's actually the Trust puts together programs where there are really thematic synergies explored. So every year there is not, it's all based of course, being National Trust for Canada on some aspect of heritage conservation, but it's no longer uh, sort of just about that. It's recognizing the interconnectedness of everything that we do, wh whatever kind of practitioner or person living in the world that you are that how we uh, experience our world and how we build our world and what we do and what we plan and what we build, how that relates to our environment and, and our world. Uh, and this year is uh, no exception and is really a wonderful highlight um, to try to understand those really important issues that are not separate from the conservation work that's done. In fact, they are, uh, uh, interconnected and serve each other synergistically and are of, of one way of thinking. So tonight's guest, guest lecturer has certainly spent his career uh, looking at these things. Um, but before I go any further, I, I just want to acknowledge that the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, nations who understand and who, underst who understood and understand intrinsically the relationship between how we live and the natural world. And in this area, these nations include the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, as I said, the National Trust Conference is a great time for people to uh, fertilize and cross-fertilize and pollinate ideas and, uh, and, and influence each other's way of thinking. And as, before we go any further, I want to introduce uh, Natalie Bull, the Executive Director of the National Trust for Canada, the original influencer. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, such a pleasure to be here in this incredibly beautiful space. Uh, for zero is a positive number, a really special um, special bonus to the National Trust Conference. I, I do see lots of lanyards, so I think many of you are uh, here for the National Trust Conference, but I, for those who aren't, I did want to say a word or two about the National Trust. We are a national charity created almost 50 years ago to be the National Trust for Canada in that British tradition. Uh, but the organization pretty quickly twisted that traditional national trust modus operandi to suit the scale and the mindset of this big country. And we continue to reinvent our purpose and our programs to respond to what matters now. We believe that historic places are a gateway to important conversations about the past and more importantly about the present and the future. We know heritage conservation can respond to a suite of concerns, including waste, limited resources, and growing social and economic inequities. We know that older buildings in particular are critical for sustainable communities, central to responding to climate change, and vital to our collective well-being and sense of place. Yet every day, more and more are lost, and those losses cut the heart and soul out of our communities and send tons of valuable building material to landfill. We know that volunteers, charities, community groups, homeowners, business leaders, and private citizens face barriers that make it challenging for them to preserve and repurpose older buildings. So much of our work at the Trust is really designed to strengthen the movement 
uh, engage the public in the future of historic places and influence the system in which uh, historic places exist to try and level that playing field. So this conference, the Heritage Reset, is, is in collaboration with the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals and the Indigenous Heritage Circle, is our biggest annual gathering to really do that work of strengthening the sector. And I think you'll agree, heritage has never been more political or more vital on so many fronts. So the Heritage Reset, the theme of this conference, is exploring how we can accelerate our movement's potential for positive, progressive action in addressing pressing issues like climate change, rape, racism, reconciliation, affordable housing, economic resiliency, and more. And later tonight during the Q&A period, you'll, miss, you'll meet Chris Weeb, our amazing mastermind of the conference who's put a really incredible program together. I really want to thank the City of Toronto, a premier sponsor for this year's conference, uh, for, for being part of the event and for making this uh, incredible evening possible in this extraordinary space. Tonight's session is really a bonus round for conference delegates and for, for others who were lucky enough to make their way into this incredible room tonight. And our speaker, Carl Elefante, is really a rock star of heritage and sustainability. He is someone who for almost 20 years has been at the forefront of resetting heritage for climate action. He's done that in private practice, uh, in his leadership roles at the Association for Preservation Technology, the American Institute of Architects, Architecture 2030, and the Climate Heritage Network. I met Carl almost 20 years ago in a narrow hallway at his architectural firm in Washington, DC. People were squeezing past us and there was all this hubbub in this really busy office, but we got locked into a really passionate conversation about the important intersection of preservation and sustainability. And before that conversation was over, I had twisted Carl's arm into leading the Association for Preservation Technologies Technical Committee on Sustainability and Preservation. And the rest is history. Not long after that, Carl coined the famous phrase, the greenest building is the one that already exists, and uh, has really gone on to become an incredibly powerful and articulate advocate for people, places, and the planet. So it's really uh, such a thrill to, to, be, to have the uh, uh, privilege to introduce Carl tonight, and I can't wait to hear what he has to bring as his message. Thank you, Carl. Well, good evening. Uh, don't expect me to live up to any of that. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I, there's no place I'd rather be than to be in a room full of people who really consider the stewardship of the, of the world around us and the built environment part of it particularly as something that is worth uh, coming out on an evening and sitting in a room and talking about. So. Uh, you know, the, 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 this is really where I belong, and, and it's really great to see a room full of people who also feel like they belong here. Uh, those introductions by Mary and, and Natalie were, were just terrific. Uh, I think reset is exactly the right term to be thinking about today, uh, as we are at, I think, a very important uh, reset moment. In, in so many different ways, and, and I'm gonna talk about a pretty broad spectrum of what really that means. But, uh, you know, we have this uh, stewardship uh, just instinct, you know, this sense that uh, we have been the lucky recipients of a legacy of uh, just an incredible amount of caring, an incredible amount of resource investment that really brought us this world that we get to enjoy. And what's our role in it? Well, the first part of that role is to live it and enjoy it. But the second part of that role is to really uh, enhance it and, 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 and give it to the next generation to enjoy and appreciate. Uh, and the world that we're doing that in requires this reset to take place. So give me a half a second here. I've got to find the water. And um, just let me get myself, thank you. Let me just get myself a little bit ready here. So, great. 
Um, so Natalie mentioned that, you know, chances are if you've ever heard my name before, you've heard it in association with the greenest building is one that is already built. And I just want to tell you the story of, of that because it's actually a story for tonight. Uh, I was at a conference like this. Uh, it was actually all lawyers and accountants talking about historic tax credits. So by the time I came to the lectern, everybody's brain was absolutely fried. And I just went, you know what? We have to have some fun. I've got to get some energy in the room here. I just can't go up there and give you know, presentation number 83. I was like, OK, we need a chant. So ah, I have an idea. We'll do this. And it was a call and response thing. So I got about four or 500 lawyers and accountants to do this with me. So the greenest building is? one that is already built. The greenest building is one that is already built. So I think we need to duplicate that here tonight. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to go back to, actually, I'm going to hide this slide. Um, and I'm going to, oh, no, this has the same words on it. I have to go, okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this is a test now, okay, and let's just see how we do. So the greenest building is? One that's already built. All right. One more time. I get, let's really give it all you have. Ready? The greenest building is? One that's already built. All right. I just want you to know you did way better than the lawyers and the accountants. Uh, not that I have anything against them. The question in my family was, why didn't you become a lawyer? Everybody else did. But at any rate. So, uh, you know, it, it, we, we need to have fun with this. We need to have energy with this. But it's also really serious. And I, I'm very happy to say that uh, people followed that lead and really did the homework, the work that I'm far too lazy to do, and, and uh, you know, really have put the facts behind this. And, and th there's a great deal of truth to the greenest building is the one that's already built. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure that you all know this Preservation Green Lab study that was done by the National Trust in uh, 2011. Uh, the facts support our hearts in this. And it's even more true today as we start to look at climate change and, the, and, the, and actually the interconnected challenges that Natalie mentioned. Uh, it, it is more true today the, the importance of our stewardship mindset of really being the stewards of a legacy uh, and keeping the value of that legacy intact for the, another generation and another generation. So I'm going to cover a lot of territory to just sort of paint a picture of the umbrella that this fits in. I've had the opportunity with getting involved with AIA leadership and, and other things with Architecture 2030 and the Climate Heritage Network of literally like getting out of the office, which in the architectural and preservation profession, that's very hard to do. It's very hard to pick up your head and, and look beyond the project that you're working on. And I got to do that for years. I've spent most of the last 10 years doing this and being out in the world and understanding how this intersects with these larger issues. So I had the incredible privilege of getting to do that. I just have to share that with you because I know that few of you will have the opportunity to be able to step away from the daily routine enough to get these perspectives. So fasten your seatbelts. I want to cover a lot of territory. Uh, so we have to talk about the Paris Agreement and this amazing woman, Christiana Figueres, who got 200 nations to agree that there was a climate emergency and we had to do something about it. And it didn't matter necessarily whether it was in the interest of their nation, it was in the interest of the world. Someday we will look back on what happened in Paris in 2015 and say, this is one of the most amazing moments in the history of humankind. And here we are today realizing that what happened there only seven years ago it's actually time for a reset. The agreements that were made then are not sufficient. Uh, the work that was outlined that had to be done then won't get the job done. We have to do more. We have to do it quicker. 
and our role in it is, is significant. Um, I'll just give you a little idea. So from last year's climate summit, the Glasgow Climate Summit, you know, this is one of the little data points that was presented. Here are these plans of how we're going to get to zero. Where are we? Well, this is where we are. Those are what are called the nationally determined contributions. This is what the nations of the world have committed to do about climate change. This is what needs to be done. So we are not even really on the road. What was agreed to in Paris was a great start. It was historic, but we have a lot of work to do much, much faster than we're doing it today. Uh, just to do a little bit of nerd dive, and I'm going to do this a few times tonight, uh, what does the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change do? How do they function? Well, mostly what they do is they receive hundreds of models of what, will, what is happening with climate change. And what does that mean for all these different economic sectors and peoples from all around the world and so on? And they sort of compare those models. And what they basically come up with is these two conclusions. What is the percentage chance that that will work? And where is the target? Is it a high target, a low target, somewhere in between? So you will hear the conversation, for example, from Glasgow about keep 1.5 alive. How do we keep global warming to be capped at no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius? So that's the limit at the bottom of this chart. And then these are scenarios that say we have a 50% chance of getting that, or a 66% chance of getting it, or a 90% chance of getting it. So this is all really difficult modeling to come up with scenarios about what might happen if we behave in certain ways. So if this feels like we're really sort of at the edge, trying to feeling our way through the dark, that's exactly where we are with this. This is very difficult material. It's very challenging for the scientists. Where are we in the building sector? Well, in, the, in this umbrella of the UN Environment Program and uh, the International Energy Agency and the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, I mean, this is enormous undertaking when you get 200 nations involved. These are the things that are being tracked. And I won't even go into them, but you see there's only one green box. <laughs> All the rest of the boxes are, are orange or red. So even in the building sector, and frankly, if it wasn't for LED lighting, we wouldn't have any green boxes. We would not be achieving anything uh, to where we need to be. So we have a, a lot of work to do. Um, I'll just give you a kind of a counter version of the world and, and, the, and the work of uh, Julian Allwood and a consortium of UK universities who basically have looked at the UK climate plan and said, the UK Climate Action Plan, it's neither action nor a plan. And you know, what do we really need to do to get to zero? And I'll just give you one anecdote. For transportation, they basically say, look, flying is completely crazy. It is way too fuel consumptive. The, you know, the, the energy per mile travel will never be good. I don't care what kind of fuel you use that will always be the worst possible way to get from point A to point B in terms of any of the resource allocation necessary to get you there. You know, the least resource allocation is ride a bike. And so, so what they've said for transportation for the UK is we'll have three international airports, Belfast, uh, uh, Heathrow, and Glasgow, and all the other airports will be closed by 2050, and all regional travel will happen by rail because that is the most energy efficient way to get lots of people from point A to point B. So we've got to start thinking outside the box. Uh, the plan that we're on is neither action nor a plan. I just want to say a couple things about the climate crisis. Um, I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, I literally grew up at a time when we were uh, trained in grade school to get under our desks to protect us from the nuclear bomb. Uh, I don't think that was going to work. Uh, but even as a six or seven year old, I didn't think it was going to work. But that world that was 
John Fitzgerald Kennedy's world when he, when he took office, he talked about the hour of maximum danger that his generation faced. And what he meant was that nuclear holocaust was a real threat to all civilization. And he basically challenged his generation to accept its destiny. That that was just the, the, the way that the deck was dealt to his generation. And the climate crisis and all the interlocking things that Natalie referred to, that's what we got dealt. We don't really have a choice whether we get to deal with it or not. We have to deal with it. This is the thing that destiny has asked us to solve. Well, let's get busy. And uh, if you don't know about the climate crisis, please inform yourself about it. I won't even ask you to read David Wallace Wells' book unless you have a good constitution. But just Google Thwaites Glacier. That's your assignment for tonight. Google Thwaites Gr Glacier and look at the consequences that could come between now and 2030. Uh, this is an emergency that we have to feel urgent about what's going on. And I'll just say two more things about it. Bill Gates, somebody that has a reputation for actually being able to get some things done, uh, he recognizes that this is the biggest challenge that humanity's ever faced, that we have to do more. The, the Marshall Plan, the New Deal, anything that came before this, th they are just walks in the park compared to the scale of what we have to do here. We have to retool everything that has become addicted to fossil fuels over the last 200 years of industrialization. We have to retool it all. It has to happen everywhere, and it will affect the lives of everyone. So everything, everywhere, everyone, that's a big job. And right now, we don't have the social and economic organs in place to get the job done. I cry when I think how close we came to having Al Gore as the president of the United States. And that instead of having climate change being a federal policy starting in 2001, that here we are 21 years later, and we just got the first legislation in the United States of America passed to do something about this. That's an applause line. We got that bill passed. You are allowed to applaud. But we're not where we need to be. That's the beginning, that's not the end. So enough about that. What do we do about it? What's our world? How do we as the stewards of the built environment, how, what do we do? What, what can we contribute to this? So the first thing that we need to do is let's at least understand the information. What's the data that tells us about our job? And I'll just gonna, again, sort of anecdotally just mention a couple of things. Almost every city in North America is characterized by this. There are mountains of very dense buildings in the core surrounded by prairies of very low scale buildings. They are almost equal from a greenhouse gas point of view to being equal problems. We have two very different problems we need to solve. We need to solve them both. Um, I have spent my life in the non-residential sector. Uh, when I first put, you know, saw these numbers, it, it sort of took my breath away saying, well, I'm not paying attention to what really matters here. In the United States of America, almost two thirds of the building stock is single family houses. So we have to solve that problem, not just uh, zero net energy high schools. Um, we have to address modern era buildings that, that literally 60% of the building stock in the United States of America, of the, 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 again, I'm, I'm looking at non-residential numbers here, are second half of the 20th century aging modern era buildings we have to find a way to work with these buildings. We can't tear them down. And we're in a perfect case study right now. You know, this building has to be sustained. It has to be useful for generations to come. Um, and just to give you one more dimension to this, about 10% of the, of, the, of the area of the buildings of the non-residential building stock are these very large buildings like the one we're in right now. So 
where's your priority? Well, let's start with these really large buildings. You know, that's one place. The other priority, let's start with the single family houses. Those two things are uh, just, you know, places where we can make a big difference quickly. So uh, let me just talk a little bit about emissions uh, because the, the world has changed now. When I did the greenest building is one that's already built, we were kind of talking about energy efficiency. The word emissions was essentially never spoken. Now we have a new language, it's emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions, that's the coin of the realm. Uh, it will have King Charles's face on it before you know it. Um, so uh, just a little bit of the language there, scope one, two, and three emissions that in the energy world, this is what they talk about. Uh, those are direct, indirect, uh, and embodied emissions. Um, you will oftentimes hear, oh, you know, the building sector, it's the biggest economic sector creating more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector. You know, 37% of emissions come from the building sector. That's actually not quite true. It's 37% of the energy-related emissions come from the building sector. I'll get back to that in a little bit, a little bit later. So what does this mean? Well, direct emissions, these are the easiest to picture. We have equipment in our buildings that consumes fossil fuels. We need to get all of it out of our buildings. I actually live in a little town outside of Washington, DC, that in 2040, all the natural gas in the town is gonna to be removed. We won't even have the pipes in the street after 2040. That's what we need to do to our buildings. We need to get the fossil fuels out of them. The second, the indirect emissions are the most confusing because all of this equipment, it's in your building. But the emissions are not coming from this equipment in your building. The emissions are coming from the power plants that are generating the power, power that those building, that those equipments are, the, that that equipment is, is consuming in your building. So the emissions are actually related to the power sector. And where are we getting our emissions from? The fossil fuels that we're using to generate the power. And in the US, nearly two thirds of the power of the power to this day is generated with fossil fuels. And then the last one is scope three, which is the industry that supports our built you know, environment. And you know, again, for us, it's pretty easy to picture. It's all that steel that gets manufactured, that concrete. Concrete is uh, China's the number one emitter in the world. The US is the number two emitter in the world, and concrete is the number three emitter in the world. That's how much emission is associated with the concrete industry and construction. So that's, that, that's our language, emissions. That's where the emissions come from in what we do. Uh, the thing in this conversation that is absolutely the missing link is the relationship between how those emissions uh, are, are created and how we are going to get rid of them and really understanding the scenarios to get rid of them. So this is another way of looking at that chart with 37%, uh, the IEA chart. So some of it is coming from power generation. Some of it is coming from the industry on the right that supports us. And then some of it is coming from the actual operations of the buildings. Great. Okay, that, that's great. We understand where that's coming from. Oh, not so fast, though. These are the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change numbers, completely different numbers. Um, I, I, I'm just bringing this up to say, watch the data. Pay attention to the data. Who is sourcing it? What is their ax to grind? What are they, you know, where is this coming from? Not even the UN can agree on how many gigatons of carbon is being directly released by buildings. Okay, this is not easy stuff. So, tr you know, train yourself, get good at this. We need to get good at this. To get to zero, these are the things that need to happen. It's actually pretty simple. We have to have power that's generated from renewables. It's got to be non-polluting power sources. We have to have the industry that supports us also be non-polluting. It needs non-polluting power as well. 
but its ways of making materials and its, and its supply chains and so on, they also have to be carbon neutral. And then last but not least, our buildings themselves need to be carbon neutral, which there's hardly even a good definition of, but let me just give you a three-part definition to it. The first is to make them as energy efficient as possible. And, you know, the codes are actually getting pretty good today in terms of the level of energy uh, efficiency that is required. The second thing we need to do is, as I said before, get the fossil fuels out of them. They need to be all electric buildings. All electric buildings are a market reality today. This is not some pie in the sky thing that, you know, give it another 30 years and we'll get it. This is available to us today. We can have really high performance, really comfortable, wonderful places to live that are, are fossil fuel free. And then last but not least is the ability to integrate things like photovoltaics into our buildings. Th this differentiates the building sector from every other sector. We have what we need. We just have to scale it up and do it and make it a 100% solution, not, oh yeah, 3% of the buildings did this and 5% of the buildings did that. We just have to get to 100%. We have what we need to do it. Uh, the agricultural sector, trying to figure out how they're gonna grow food at, with, with global warming. You know, so we're in a very privileged position in the building sector to basically have what we need. Let's get to it. And the last dimension of this is really then, okay, well, apply it. What does this really mean in terms of the living places, the cities that we occupy? They grow. New buildings will be built. And the reality of building new buildings is that they really, really pollute a lot to make them, that the embodied emissions that come from making buildings are extremely high. And yes, there is a new generation of using timber construction and things like that that are beginning to find ways to bring that number down. But conventional construction today is still enormously polluting. Uh, there's a total misnomer that when you build a new green building, it lowers our emissions footprint. It doesn't, it adds to it. You just brought a new building online. Unless that's a zero net energy building, it's adding operational carbon. It's not subtracting operational carbon. And even just from making it, you have generations of operating a building to capture all that carbon that that new building released. So the only way that new buildings actually reduce direct and indirect carbon emissions is by replacing other buildings. Literally, that's the only way. Otherwise, the numbers are all going up. Um, that is not understood by almost every building department sustainability officer in the country. That is not understood. We've got a column on the carpet about that stuff. Who understands it? We do. And why do we understand it? Because this is our reality. Our reality of retrofitting existing buildings is that we have to do a very little to them to make them great operating buildings. And that very little work that we do to them really reduces the operational carbon level. So we understand that. We have a scenario, which is the greenest building is one that's already built, that is totally needed, that is the missing piece in the puzzle of climate change. Uh, that, well, if all of us in this room understand it, we're about a quarter of the people in the country that understand it. And then the, I just want to close the loop here to say, what does this mean with a city like Toronto? We have to balance these two things. We have to balance the growth that must and will happen with the retrofit that is needed. And when I crunch the numbers using US you know, averages of averages, just kind of looking at a national picture, to keep the embodied emissions from tilting the scale to an impossible uh, degree, to, to, to an unrecoverable degree, we need to renovate at about a three times faster rate than our growth. So in other words, for every 100,000 square feet of new building, we need 300,000 square feet of existing buildings renovated to be zero net energy buildings. And that's the only way we keep that embodied emission 
side of the scale from tilting out of control. And again, there's not a sustainability office in the country that has that relationship between growth and retrofit as a policy. This is our story that we need to tell, that we need to go talk to our mayors about and let them know that we can't build our way to a climate solution. We have to conserve our way to a climate solution. We have to adapt and retrofit our way to a climate solution. There is no builder way to it. Who understands that? We understand that. Um, this is what the carbon-free future is being envisioned like. Uh, visions of sugar plums is the only, is the only way to talk about it. Uh, on the left is New York City. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit more. The, the, the idea here is this, is this is a neighborhood that's right around Grand Central Station. We're going to tear down 50-story buildings to build 100-story buildings. That's going to save humankind. And the one on the right, which is uh, Vincent Cayabo in Paris, at least he's got the idea that maybe there's something besides glass boxes out there that might be a solution, you know, and he's actually thinking a little bit about, well, how do we have, you know, greenery and energy generation and things like that as part of our urban systems. So these are the visions of sugar plums that New York City, they changed their zoning to make that happen. And again, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, is the vision for the future that we need to have sealed buildings with automated uh, climate control systems in them that have biofeedback that tell them, you know, whether you're too hot or too, really, is that our future? Is the future to transportation, everybody owns a $50,000 Tesla? There's gotta be other ways. There's, you know, uh, going back to, you know, Julian Allwood, hey, whatever happened to rail service? You know, we built a whole country around rail service. You know, really, Teslas are the solution to transportation? I don't think so. There's way too much that goes into making a Tesla. You know, get, get some scooters out there. Get some bicycles out there. We just don't need that. That is not the solution when we shouldn't accept it as the solution. I am a Luddite. I admit it. Uh, I look at a building like this is the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., originally built as a pension building. This is a very large-scale building that was built in the 1880s, and it has, uh, you know, air stratification that, you know, you open the windows at the top, you open the windows at the bottom, it creates its own breeze. You know, these are, these are the, the wisdom of the ages that we have to bring back into this conversation. The Teslas are not the solution. They're just not. Who knows that? Nobody knows it better than we in this room. So I just want to kind of put my built heritage hat on a minute and, and get us all really psyched up about, you know, being in the built heritage sector and how important it is that we are. You know, we recognize that built heritage is just one dimension to heritage, and it's actually a very material uh, version. A lot of heritage people are much more into the, you know, intangible heritage sides of it. We're really into kind of the bricks and mortar side of it. I don't think we have to be apologetic about that. We just have to be realistic and aware of that, that how much kind of material orientation that we have with what we do. Uh, there, it's important that we pay attention to those things. Built heritage is absolutely fundamental to our understanding of humanity, our understanding of civilization, our understanding to our identity. Uh, it is, it is uh, the preponderance of heritage from the longest periods ago that we have. Uh, it is uh, enormously important to every culture in the world. It's also living heritage. You can go in a heritage building and you can experience almost exactly the same thing that the people experienced in that space a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, five thousand years ago. That is amazing. And there's really no equal in uh, any other dimensions of heritage. 
You know, so there's a, there's a you know, there's, you know, in dining, experience dining, retail, experience retail. You know, we're kind of awakening to the importance of experience. Well, experience architecture, experience place. We have the ability to do that, and it sets built heritage apart from every other kind of heritage. I mentioned the sort of materiality of it. You know, we do have many challenges to just keep this material world together. It's a big, it's a big challenge, it's a big topic, it's a very rewarding thing to do. Um, during my career, this has really gone through a revolution what the tools are that are available to us to do analysis. Uh, you know, just, it, it's really a much, much uh, more sort of mature world where the kind of building sciences that support us and so on are just really exciting. This is just wonderful work to do. Um, but it's not the only dimension to what we do. Historic preservation has uh, many sides to it. It's very easy to look at these beautifully restored buildings and say, of course they're valuable, of course these buildings you know, are, are uh, important to preserve and so on. But we all know that the reality of our world is that most of these buildings are really, really hard to convince anybody to value them. These four buildings, three of them were threatened with demolition before we got to do the work on them. So there are buildings like this, the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. That building was built to be a landmark. It has beautiful art in it. It's on a site that's a, you know, part of a, you know, the, the Washington Mall. I mean, the people that built this building knew that they were doing a significant work, and it was to last forever, and they built it to last forever. This project is literally one that we did. It was an obsolete building. It was built as a power plant. In a lot of ways, it's not even a building. It was a brick shell built around uh, turbines, coal-fired turbines. And of course, the, you know, that, that operation is gone. So being able to adapt buildings, it's just got to be part of what we do. It's got to be part of our toolkit. Uh, this was a building, believe it or not, designed by the same person that built that, fire, that power plant. Uh, that was abandoned as part of a, an enormous generational urban abandonment of Detroit. You know, that, 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 just the idea of that lets everybody, you know, pick up tents and just abandon the city. How crazy wasteful was that? But we, had, we, you know, my childhood was a whole generation of watching these cute little towns that we lived in or these big beautiful cities that we lived in get abandoned for a subdivision somewhere. Uh, so again, you know, rescuing discarded buildings is an important part of what we do. And I just have to mention these modern era buildings again and the importance of them. Uh, we have that 50 year rule in the United States that you know, a building becomes eligible when it's 50 years old. That seems to be the magic age of when everybody hates a building. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that 50 year old stuff, that's junk. Show me the 100 year old stuff, that's cool. We'll preserve that. And we just can't let that happen with the modern era buildings. We have to find the reuse of them. And I'm gonna dig into this a little bit. So regardless of what you think of the architecture, uh, I just want you to know that when I was in architecture school, these were like the two coolest buildings in the country. You know, it's like, whoa, Boston City Hall, wow. I remember going to Boston just to see it. And, you know, wow, that L.A. theme building, man. Oh, that was designed by an African-American architect? You're kidding. Wow, it's amazing. So, you know, so look, uh, these buildings had significance to them when they were built. You know, the, the people that built both of those were, you know, building for the ages. Um, and we have to remember that when we're faced with things, like I mentioned this before, the, the Midtown Manhattan upzoning. So this idea is that we're gonna get rid of those buildings on the left, and we're gonna build those buildings in the middle there. So we're gonna tear down the 50-story buildings, and we're gonna build 100-story buildings. And you know what the, the term is for that? Smart growth. Okay. Um, so uh, 
I'm sure you guys know the, the, the Rocky Mountain Institute. You know, one of these research groups like, oh my God, the Rocky Mountain Institute said that? That is truth, man. There's no, you can't argue with that. RMI said it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, McKinsey or something. You know, it's just like, the, oh, those guys said it. That must be the real deal. So this study done by Terrapin and Bright Green, which is Bill Browning's group after he left RMI, is the study that basically justified that rezoning. Oh, those 50s era, 60s era buildings, those things are junk. You know, we'll just, we can just get rid of them. They're not of any value. So we're going to tear the 50-story 50, 50, uh, buildings down and replace them with 100-story buildings. That is going to be a win-win for the city. And that building that I showed pictured there is uh, what was originally built as a Union Carbide headquarters. By the way, it was a career moment for one of New York's only women architects at the time, Natalie Dubois, who was a design partner at Skidmore Owens and Merrill. Uh, so it had the, you know, the social significance to it as well. Uh, and that building is now in the trash. And the new 100-story building is under construction. So that only lasted 50 years, not even the 53 years of Penn Station. Did we learn anything from Penn Station? Oh yeah, we save buildings that look like that. That's what we learned from Penn Station. No, that's, that's wrong. We, what we really needed to learn was that a building that's 50 years old is not ready for the trash heap. And we have to do that with modern era buildings. We just can't let that go on. And so now let me just talk green building architect at you for a while. You know, so from the green building side, you know, well, well you know, that's okay. We want to do green buildings. We don't care about that old stuff. Uh, so, you know, is there a green building justification for keeping existing buildings? And, you know, even in the, in the sort of highest levels of green building, you're now really beginning to hear people pay attention to life cycle. And mostly what they do is they deal with it on this level, which is, you know, what is the material sourcing? What are the processes of that material? Like this is going on with concrete right now. How can we find ways to make concrete so it's a green material instead of uh, you know, the, the incredibly polluting material it is today? But that's not the only meaning of life cycle. The next is uh, the assembly level. And this is something that is in every aspect of how we build buildings today. Buildings are not crafted by craft people that know a thing. They are manufactured off-site and they're assembled. The assemblies are put together on-site. Buildings are assembled now. They're not crafted anymore. And what are they made out of? Well, this is a window. It's not a, by the way, introduce you to a window. There's a window. A window is not a piece of glass anymore. It's two or three or four pieces of glass. It has coatings, it has gases in it, it has separation bars, and it has sealants that hold it all together. The sealants are really actually pretty no good, and they fail in 20 or 30 or 40 years. The glass will last a thousand years, as we know, unless you throw a rock through it. You know, so you're taking materials that are good for a thousand years, and you're marrying them together into a, an assembly with a weak link that's only good for 20 or 30 or 40 years, that is a wastefulness and a stupid idea. That is not sustainable design. That is not sustainable technology. Just, we have to call this out. We can't accept that this is, this is the Tesla being the solution to, to, to uh, transportation. This is not the solution to building green buildings. We have to be able to take these assemblies apart, fix them, and put them back together. That's what we do as preservationists, and we know how to do it. We can't do it with this, this material. And the thing that we know more than anything else is what it means to have building life cycles, and that buildings are multiple, multiple systems that have things that last for a very long period of time and very, need very little work, and then other things that really need uh, attention very routinely. You have to repaint every 10 years or, or, or whatever it is. We understand those life cycles. I wish that we would uh, teach this lesson 
to the new building world and have designers thinking about life cycles and how to take buildings apart and put them back together again where they need to be, when they need to be, to keep them going. We have some work to do to teach that. So what we do with re, re, uh, you know, reconditioning and, and renewing and rescuing buildings, the value that it has in the climate change conversation is avoided emissions. And I want to teach you avoided emissions. And I'm going to take you back to that modern era building that I showed you from Detroit. Um, this building didn't get torn down because it was going to cost too much. And almost 20 years later, uh, we got to recondition this building and go from, have it go from an office building to a, a residential building. It's this neighborhood, which has a huge hospital here and a university there. Finally, somebody woke up and said, gee, I'd like to live right there. And this property became valuable again. Um, what we did to this building was quite a major rehab of this building. So, you know, we reconditioned the skin uh, for the purposes of this energy model. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what completely replacing the skin would be because I want to show you sort of the worst case scenario from an emission standpoint. Um, we of course redid the whole insides so that it became apartments with kitchens and bathrooms and so on, not an office, just big open space. And then, of course, the thing we kept was the basic building structure of the floor plates and so on. Um, so what does this mean in the world of emissions? How does this play out? And where's our baseline? Our baseline is that we had an existing building, and if it had been occupied, uh, it would be consuming energy to just operate that building. So that's our baseline. How can we save in relationship to that baseline? What's our, what's our emissions uh, net benefit from doing a project? Well, so that's the baseline. The first thing we have to add in is the embodied emissions. We added the skin, it's just a little tiny slice. Then we added the space plan work that we did and new air conditioning systems and so on. And then we start to operate the building again, and it starts to consume uh, energy, and it starts to release emissions again. By the way, I've actually shown three different levels here, the 60% code level, the 80%, the coming code level, and then the zero net energy blue line. You know, so the theory is that we're going to get to zero net energy buildings where there won't be any operational emissions. The only thing that will matter will be embodied emissions. So there we are. There's our renovation scenario. We have a payback that's in the five, six, seven year period before after the embodied emissions that we spent on the project are now saving us uh, operational emissions. And we have a huge amount of avoided emissions from that. So let's look at the replacement scenario. We tear the building down. We've got to do the same embodied work that we did, but now we're adding the structure. Look at how much more we've added just by replacing the structure of the building. Now we're starting to generate those uh, operational emissions again. And, and our payback now is in the 13 to 17 year range. And our savings is this little tiny wedge, even in, even in the best case scenario. So look at the difference here between the investment in embodied energy and the return in operational energy savings. And at a net zero energy scenario, which is what we need to get to, it just makes it so it's all about the embodied energy. There is nothing more important than keeping existing buildings and avoiding all of that embodied energy that is just not needed if you just work with what you have. And, you know, Toronto is actually, in a way, really leading uh, in, in a way on this uh, with the you know, uh, Toronto Tower neighborhoods rehab work. I know that this is something that's come and gone a couple times, and it's hard to have policy continuity on it, but you actually have, a, have an idea about what this could look like in your community to actually really work with the building stock that you have. Um, and I, I'm just going to spend the last couple of minutes and, and go back to, to uh, what Natalie was talking about, these interlocking crises. 
because we're not just solving uh, an emissions crisis. It's tied to many other things. The reality of, of that interlocking nature, the whole notion of sustainable design is something that we've known for a very long time. I wish that we had listened to these scientists in 1972. We would be in a completely different place. But the, the notion that continued population growth and continued uh, you know, industrial expansion at some point was going to hit a crunch point where the consequences, and literally they introduced the term emissions, by the way, and they meant many kinds of emissions, not just greenhouse gas emissions, that at some point the overreach of growth would cross the line with the emissions uh, degradation side of it, and, and we would have a problem. Uh, and where we are in terms of their estimates 50 years later is they are really, really proving how accurate their thinking was. We were, the, 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 this is actually a diagram showing how on track their predictions were. And, well, I'll just leave that alone. Uh, so we've known this, the very notion of sustainable development has been a recognition of the interlocking, uh, interlocking aspect of these problems that we face that are social, economic, and environmental. It was recognized at Paris that it was interlocking. It was particularly so because the Paris Agreement happened in a conference that took place in a very consequential year at the United Nations. A few months earlier in New York City had been the Sustainable Development Conference where these Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. So, and, and, I'm, and I know that many of you are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals. So even as Paris happened, the notion that it was part of this larger picture of what the you know, economic and equity and environmental uh, you know, universe was that climate change was part of. And then within a few months after Paris was Habitat 3 in Quito, Ecuador. And what Habitat 3 was about was saying, OK, we have all those problems like poverty and food security and all those sorts of things. We have climate change, which is changing all the circumstances, and we have to get on that. And by the way, whatever the solution is, is, is in a thing called the city. That the cities are the tool that allows humanity to thrive. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's what we invented as a species for us to thrive in. And all of these issues will be addressed in the cities that we create. So we have all these problems, they all interlock, climate change is, got it. the fire's burning, we gotta do something about it, and the solution is making a built environment that will solve the problems instead of make the problems. So it gets us right back into the middle of all that. I'm just gonna mention the other side of, of our heritage world, which is the cultural side. And you know we perpetuate culture by saving buildings. And we need to kind of come to terms with that. And uh, actually our introduction tonight that Mary gave us, you know, your society is doing, I think an admirable job compared to what my society in the US is doing. We're still in the ignore it all phase. Um, you know, so you're, you're actually trying to reconcile. You know, that's amazing that, you know, we need to do a lot of that. Um, We've done work at Mount Vernon, and you know a lot of what we've done is to bring George Washington to be a real person to people. And by the way, he enslaved people, and by the way, he had hundreds of people that made it so that his lifestyle was possible. Uh, he was an agrarian. He actually was a, a, a distiller. After he retired from the presidency, he became a whiskey maker. Very few people know that about, about him, but he, he was the biggest whiskey maker in the United States of America at that time. Um, so the whole people matter, and you know, the whole truth matters too. And you know, so in the US, we had the redlining thing that happened, you know, where we literally tore our cities down based on racial notions and uh, took neighborhoods like the Hill District in, in in uh, Pittsburgh, oh, well, that's just an African-American neighborhood. We can tear that down. 
and put up a highway and put up a hockey rink. Th th that was considered to be smart growth. You know, that was considered to be cutting edge. This is what we needed to be doing. We have to be truthful with ourselves about where we are, where we came from. We had an amazing demonstration of this in the last couple of years. In the US, the Black Lives Matter thing, I think was uh, you know, really historic. I think the pandemic definitely influenced it. Um, but the, the symbols became part of the conversation. And you know, the, the, uh, this is you know, Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia with all the Civil War general statues aligning it. We as artists, and we, should, we have to recognize that we're artists in what we do, we v envision the future. And you know, so Kahindi Weil, who, who, Wiley, who is known mostly for his presidential portrait of Barack Obama, he worked with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond years before and said, you know, we've got to pop that bubble, that equestrian statue thing. You know, let's let's attack that. So they did this uh, project for the museum called Rumors of War, which is a contemporary African American on a horse in front of the museum. You know, just to just to say, you know, this is a this is a cultural statement. This is using art and culture and heritage to say, what are we celebrating here? Why are we doing that? Uh, we have that power in what we do. Um, uh, this confrontation side of it, it's beginning in the US. We're beginning to really have it into our cultural institutions, but we have to accelerate it. One other dimension of this and, a, and the dimension of the reset is that we're now in the at the moment where the conversation between the global north and the global south is beginning. At Paris, it didn't really happen. Uh, now it's beginning to happen. Uh, what are the cities around the world? What about informal cities? Uh, what, what are the conditions that we're uh, really perpetuating with our ideas about urbanism today? And what are we going to do about them as conservationists? Um, this modern world, many, many, many cities around the world, and I've visited several of them, look like this. Uh, these completely informal places, some of them with no water, no electricity, no schools, no fire stations, no nothing, you know, are surrounding uh, these, you know, ridiculously modern cities. Um, at any rate, I don't think that we can be, uh, you know, we, we have to understand that it isn't like one's good and the other's bad. They're two different scenarios. It's, it's that mountains and prairies scenario. We have to deal with both. Uh, most of the growth that's gonna happen in the next 40 years is gonna happen in the global south. So just as I was talking about, we have the mountains problem and, we have this, and then we have the prairies problem that we have to solve, kind of a duality. We have the big, big building problem. We have the single family house problem we have to solve both ends. We've got the global north problem very little growth, huge resources, a mindset that Teslas are gonna make everything fine. And then we have the Global South, uh, incredible growth, uh, very few resources to work with, uh, very different set of problems they have to solve. I just wanna say that we really need to be careful about how we're bringing solutions into these societies. Uh, this is a project that is being heralded next month uh, at the uh, COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. This is an Egyptian version of a new green zero net energy village. It is a little version of the global north saying that this is the solution to the global south. I'm sorry, it's not. They don't need Teslas. Uh, and there are some people like Yasmin Lara who is the, the most prominent woman architect in Pakistan, who at the end of her career said, I've done enough glass boxes, I lost my way, we have to get back to what the people of Pakistan really need that is tied to our environment and our culture. And she's trying to invent uh, architecture that is truly zero net uh, carbon. Um, I just will mention this notion of 
technology leapfrogging. So Rwanda has a cell phone system. They don't need to run wires on poles. They've solved the problem in a different way. So let's not make sure that they get a Tesla dealership there. You know, that isn't what they need. They, they, already, they already have an idea about how to adapt. They have creativity and entrepreneurs that know how to take our global north ideas and make them work for them. We have this stewardship imperative. Our movement is a movement. The historic preservation movement started as a movement. It, it, we still need to have it be a movement. And we need to push our limits. We have a lot of obsolete buildings. What are we going to do with them? And th this is an example from Washington, D.C. of one of many abandoned churches in the, in the center of town that was converted to housing. Oh, is that sensitive? Does it, you know, I mean, this is a real Carlos Scarpa, get out the scalpel, cut it up. Is this okay? Uh, at what point, do, where do we draw the line? Uh, I would really uh, ask us to draw the line much more broadly than we've been drawing it so far. Um, this is a typical modern era building uh, conversion project in Washington, DC. There are literally hundreds of these buildings happening. All they're keeping is a structural frame. It's not very much different from that project I showed you in Detroit. Are we against this or are we for it? I think we need to redefine what our, where our values are on this. I, I'm for it. That building gets a new life. It's a different life, but it's a life. What are our ideas about growth? You know, uh, we're, look, look at what's being thrown at us. Um, on a much more familiar scale, what are we doing with our townhouses? What are we doing with our, you know, four-story office buildings and things like that? In Washington, D.C., if we could solve our attitude about what we're doing with our row houses and our six-story apartment buildings, we would be most of the way there. Let's not forget the context. What we do is inherently a good economic model. It's good jobs. It is very material, uh, you know, scarce. It is very uh, energy. Uh, energy expenditures are small. Uh, there's many good things that support where we are with this. We know how to make our buildings green. We know how to make them high performance. Uh, we can make zero net energy buildings just like anybody else can. We need to be engaged at the international level and really recognize that we are players in the climate change conversation and that there's a big, big role for us to play there. If for no other reason than what we care about is threatened, and it's not just threatened, it is being destroyed by climate change. Uh, that Thwaites Glacier thing that, that you gotta go do when you get home tonight, just think of what the destruction will be to heritage building stock if that comes true. And it's likely to come true. Just think of what the implications of that are going to be. Coastal, coastal cities around the world are threatened very short term, very immediately. But I just want to end with, with a kind of a hopefulness about our charge. Yes, we are faced with an hour of maximum darkness, but... Just like Kennedy did, we have to embrace it. Destiny chose us to do this. We don't get to say, no, Destiny, we want something else. And if you look at the political world, many, many, many people around the world are trying to do that, trying to say, no, 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 we don't want to deal with that. No, forget that. Make that go away. We can't. We, can't. we have to deal with it. And what did Kennedy do? He said, I welcome it. He said, I want to change the arms race into the space race. I want to take this technology that we've created to kill each other and turn it into the technology of the next pioneers and really expand you know, humankind to the next frontier. That's what we need to do with climate change. That's what we need to do with these interlocking crises. And we bring a perspective from the heritage conservation world that is missing. Your mayor does not have a program that understands how to balance rehab and growth. They need to. How are they going to understand it? 
because you're going to bring it to their attention. No one else is going to do it. We need to do it. That's what I came here to tell you about tonight. Let's all be uh, advocates in this. Let's go out there and get involved in our communities and make this happen. Our voices are needed. Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, I'm Chris Weeb. I'm the uh, manager of Heritage Policy at the National Trust in Ottawa. Delighted to be here, and I'm going to have to do this from my seat because I don't know if I can stand with this microphone. But um, I wanted to thank you, Carl, for throwing down the gauntlet for us and describing that gauntlet in incredible detail. You've really provided a roadmap uh, for us to rework our relationship with the built environment and beyond. And I want to lean into that idea of responsibility that you're bringing there and about the space race as well. Um, for the, I, remember, I remember you uh, mentioning at the uh, uh, Association for Preservation Technology and National Trust Conference in Ottawa in 2017, five years ago, that the heritage community really needs to embrace that mantle of leadership. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can, can dig into that a bit further. We're holding our conference at the Chelsea Hotel, just a few blocks away. Uh, and it's actually destined for demolition uh, in a few years, I, I, I suppose, um, to be replaced. It's 25-story tower just to be replaced by something, a number of 50-story towers. Is that a good thing? Interesting. Uh, it's the largest hotel in Canada, 1,600 square, 1,600 rooms. And I'm just thinking in aggregate, you know, in the aggregate alone in that concrete, it must have left an incredible hole in the Niagara escarpment that enfolds this city. If you could see that pit in one place, it'd be interesting. What, what is holding the heritage community back? You, you point to it. We need to embrace that mantle. What is holding us back? Is it we're, st we're still thinking in that kind of Grand Central Station mindset? We're, we're sort of boxed in by that, by uh, the way we think of ourselves and the way others think of us? What, what do we need to get... To, t to seize that role. I, I think that's part of it. And, uh, you know, th I, what, I, what I said before when I had the slide of, you know, Grand Central Station and, and 270 Park Avenue up there, there's a lot of us that look at Grand Central, uh, excuse me, Penn Station and go, yeah, we have to save that building. And there's a lot of us that would look at that 50-story box and say, that's, that's, that's not a, you know, culturally significant building. So we have to, we have to expand our horizon. But I actually think that uh, there's also the sort of what are the, what's the system that we're part of here uh, that, that is also a really big issue. And just like I was saying that no mayor uh, has a plan to really understand the relationship between retrofit and new construction, no city holds its property owners to task sufficiently. You know, so what are the criteria that a city looks at to give somebody a building permit? Is the embodied environmental footprint of their project one of the factors? Uh, anybody want to take a guess at that one? No, it's not even part of the conversation. Uh, you know, the, uh, in the real estate world, there's really two economies. There's the economy of the rental, or, or the mortgage or whatever. There's that, that f every month flow of cash related to it. But any developer worth their salt will tell you that the real value is that 40 years later, my property is now worth 20 times more. And all of a sudden, there's this whole other wealth that's been created by it. Um, the, the, the sort of the development community wants us all to believe that there's only one, and it's just the cash flow side of the equation. And you know, so on the, on the other side of the equation, how do we hold their feet to the fire? Well, we have capital gains taxes in some places. But there's, there's, there really isn't a holistic building life cycle, uh, community climate action framework for what is the significance of that project? What is the damage that project will do? What are the benefits from that project? There's, there's 
beginnings of it, like, you know, in the U.S., we have a thing that's called adequate public facilities, okay? So you're going to do a new development, and the little town that you're doing it in, you're suddenly going to take a town that has 10,000 people, and before you know it, it's going to have 20,000 people. Where are the schools? Where are the fire stations? Where are the police stations, et cetera? So there's a, a sort of a framework to begin some of those conversations about, wait a minute, there's a bigger impact to what you're doing. It's not just do we give you a building permit for 5,000 new houses. So there's some beginning of a framework there to start to work with, but we, we need to be much more both aggressive and nuanced in, in really understanding what the impacts of a project are, and, and we're just not. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. We actually have two microphones, one in, right at the bottom of each of these stairs, and I would welcome your questions. We started a little later, so I think we'll go a little bit longer as well. I wanted to, while we're waiting for a question, um, I'm wondering about that question of culture. And I'm, there's a number of many people here from the Toronto Society of Architects. I'm wondering about the role that professional architectural culture plays in that, in terms of professional training, in terms of perpetuating this kind of um, consumption growth model. Um, <sighs> professional culture and how that training feeds into that, but also, I guess, around how clients demand, they want to see a maximal impact. They want to see if they're going to be reusing an, uh, an older building. They want to see the kind of the newness, the, um, uh, and, and, and kind of heavy hand uh, communicating that. Is there, is there a role that, you know, both, both, both you know, the, 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 the professional spheres play in perpetuating some of those, some of those challenges? Uh, so that's that's a, it's a big question, and there's a lot of different sides to it. I will just say that you know, having been president of the American Institute of Architects, I had a pretty big uh, connection with the question. Um, one of the things that we did at, at AIA was to adopt what were previously known as the coat measures of of uh, you know sustainable building, as what we now call the design. A framework for design excellence. So the idea is that it doesn't just apply to coat awards, it applies to all the work we're doing. And there's been a lot of controversy associated with that, you know. Uh, and I'll just give you the example, you know, the architects doing 50,000 square foot houses um, are finding that they're not getting design awards anymore. Because mm -hmm. the juries are going, that's conspicuous consumption. Uh, we don't want to reward that. I'm sorry. And the juries are just turning away from those projects. Uh, you know, on the other hand, those are projects that are really advancing the art of architecture, at least that's the accepted notion of them. Um, and, you know, so this is, this is really challenging what are our values. Uh, and that's just an example of it. Um, I do think that I just want to walk on the other side of the block for a minute, and that is to say that we are too rigid about what we consider a saved building. Okay, I just, we are. We are just too rigid about it. And I get it for a lot of the buildings that we think about, because what we're thinking about, and I just want you to picture that chart, we're thinking about those two little orange columns over there which are the Penn Stations and the Mount Vernons and all of those absolutely wonderful historic buildings. And we aren't thinking about all those buildings in the blue block, which are run-of-the-mill buildings that are filling our cities. And uh, that building that I showed you that literally our office is now in, in Washington, DC, uh, that those are buildings that we have to find value in. And they're, which are important architecturally and culturally to be preserved the way that we're, we're approaching Penn Station. We have to make up our minds about that. And there's a lot of different answers. I mean, you know, as you know, the General Services Administration in Washington has done their own version of that and said, you know, hey, we have buildings by, you know, whoever, Walter Gropius. You know, so we're going to preserve those buildings just like they were Mount Vernon. Uh, but all those buildings on K Street in Washington that were built for the least amount of dollars that the developer could get away with, what's our attitude about them? So we, I, we, we just have to meet that challenge as well. 
Thanks so much. Microphone over there. And if you can't come to the microphone, these are um, wireless microphones and uh, somebody can bring it to you. Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks for showing one of my favorite examples, which is the National Building Museum building. It always makes me happy to see it used as an example because it's a great one for so many things. Um, I'm in Halifax now, um, and one of the questions that we had, because we rarely get to pick brains such as yours on a ready basis, is we're seeing a lot of, when they're not just tearing down buildings, which is happening at a vast rate, we have many empty lots right now, um, we're seeing a lot of facadism. And we're wondering if you could maybe, in a, I don't know if you have this at your fingertips, but at least give a quick What's the environmental impact? Is there any environmental benefit for just saving saving that shell? Because we're seeing it as being used as an example of you know the city or the developer will say, oh, but but we're saving we're saving that. And when you look at the giant, and I've taken pictures of these mounds of rubble, it seems in some ways like the worst. It's always the worst of both worlds, if nothing else, because of the you know the steel beams that they have to prop the thing up with for months on end while they deal with it. Thank you so much. It, it, it's a great question. So I have a, a, another assignment for you, and that is for you to do the number crunching. You know, to find. Don't teach that in well, you just have to organize the committee to do the number crunching then. But the uh, you know, so so that example is a really really great one, and and my instinct says that, as you said, that, that this is not a solution, um, uh, but. It's, it's actually something that I've never tried to crunch the numbers on, but do that, do that. You know, I, I think that the lesson that comes from the number crunching is keep as much as you can possibly keep. Reuse as much as you can possibly reuse. Uh, every aspect of it has an embodied carbon footprint that you have to contend with. And the greenest building is the one that's already built. Uh, you know, so uh, I'd, I'd love to see that case study. I think, yeah, do that. That would be great. That would be a real contribution. Okay, going right for the jugular there. Okay, another qu uh, question over on this side. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much for your talk and for the information that you've shared both visually as well as textually. And you're rich background in this area is, is phenomenal just to listen to and just to hear. I remember one of the buildings you showed actually when I was in J school at Ryerson, we actually were in, the, uh, in Washington at one time and we went to a party at one of those buildings, it was an art party, and we snuck into the party, uh, don't tell anyone, um, and it was fantastic. We had a great time in that same building and you know, it was, it was a magical opportunity because it gave me a new appreciation for architecture. And when my condo was being built, I remember you know, just watching it build from, from year to year and then taking over the condo as president of the condominium corporation. And I think it was, just a, it was an awesome experience being president, but one of the biggest challenges I had at the time was trying to convince uh, some of the boomers on our board that, and, and my generation has a different perspective on retrofitting, on green energy and green ways of actually con, uh, consuming energy and electricity specifically. And it was a really tough conversation. Uh, eventually, we were able to convince them because we showed them how the bottom line in and of itself would take us from minus 22,000 in our bank account to 120,000 uh, of capital uh, over the span of two and a half years. So that was a convincing point. But I don't think I was ever forgiven for doing that as president. However, I'm trying to get to a point where we can have intergenerational conversations with our boomers about the actual benefits of these kind of changes that can cause enormous gains for us, not only economically, but also on an environmental level. So how would you advise one uh, of my generation to have those kind of conversations, and I mean this very seriously, uh, that can lead to better uh, solutions in regards to either public spaces like Union Station or even this building that was up for retrofit, uh, that was up for demolition 10 years ago. How can we have those conversations across generations that can lead us to better understanding that we need to go towards net zero and there's different ways of getting there? So, so having been on that you know, condo board or co-op board, I'm not sure whether you deserve a medal or a sainthood, uh, <laughs> but I know that th those are, those are 
very, you know, you're, those are real world experiences that you're talking about. Uh, I, I would just say that um, trying to use uh, holistic thinking, try to not lose the context. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, one of the projects that I showed that rescued abandoned building in Detroit, uh, the developer that was, uh, you know, an affordable housing developer that we were working with, um, we showed her that she would be in a position of basically having the people in her building have no utility bills. And her eyes lit up. You know, it was just, it was a dimension of affordability that she had never thought about before. But, you know, we were gonna be generating almost all the power that that building was gonna need from the roof, you know. Uh, and it really, uh, she actually ended up uh, ha having a like a marketing campaign for that building, which was um, uh, historic plus green equals good or something like that. I mean, it, it, it like it totally changed her mindset about the whole project. I'm sorry, I don't really, uh, I, I didn't, I'm not sure I quoted that right. But, you know, so uh, th there's a benefit that was lurking in a corner that no one was looking at. Let's look in all the corners. And uh, part of this really kind of goes to one of Chris's earlier questions. We also have to ask the questions that aren't being asked. We have to address the things that aren't in the formula. And I'll just give you my favorite example of this, which is I've gotten to work with some really amazing engineers and consultants over the years. And I worked with a transportation guy who I did a lot of Main Street revitalization work with. And he was one of the few transportation engineers that I've ever worked with who didn't feel like his job was going to be uh, maximized by, by having a bigger parking lot. You know, he was actually the other side of that. Maybe we don't need any parking lots, you know. Uh, and uh, he told me about the, the, the kind of scientific work that they do to justify roadway development. And you know, literally, these were the formulas developed in the 20s, and then we did this and that and the other thing. One of the things that was originally part of that analysis was a thing that they called propensity. And it was actually in the formula, there was this P, a little P, okay? And what the propensity was, was when we build the new road, what will be the propensity of people to use it? Let's not assume that nothing will change. We just built a new road. Somebody's gonna decide, well, we'll go to the beach because it's only a two hour drive instead of a three hour drive. Well, how much of that will happen? And will the new road get filled up? And as they started to get experience, especially in the 50s of building new roads, you know, things like the whole idea of an expressway, they realized that, oh, the propensity, that's an infinite number, that never goes away. Whatever we build, people will fill up until it's too much of a pain to use anymore, and then they won't use it. You know, so this whole notion of you can't build roads to solve traffic problems suddenly became the reality of traffic engineers. What did they do? They took the P out of the formula. It's like, nah, that's not part of our reality anymore. No, nah, we just aren't gonna talk about that. And so we, we, we can't let that sort of stuff happen. And, you know, with Chris's question before about the, you know, the landlords and tearing down the hotel and so on, our system today doesn't address all the things that affect our communities by development proposals, by road proposals and so on. And that's just not okay. We, we, and, and we have to help them. And we have the ability to help them because we have this perspective as stewards of the built environment. We don't have to be the transportation engineers. You know, we just be us and help people understand, you know what? We can renew that building. We have the technology to do that. We can make that a zero net energy building. We know, how the, we know the design methods that we need. We have the technology we need. It's a numbers game. Can you put, you know, can you afford to put the, uh, you know, solar panels on it and things like that? 
well, how about the fact that you don't have a utility bill anymore? How does that figure in? So we, we just have to be the advocates of the things that we know about and uh, make the conversation be more holistic because it's just not today. Thanks so much. I think we have time for just one quick last question. So we'll just go over to that, uh, that microphone there. Yes, please. Hi there. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very informative and really inspiring too. Uh, so I live and work in East Gwillimbury, which is one of the fastest growing municipalities in New York region. Uh, and one of the things that's going to happen in my area is there's the Bradford Bypass, which is going to connect the 404 highway to the 400 highway. And one of the on-ramps is going to pass by an her a heritage house that was designated. It's called the Harrison Holborn House, which is built in 1824. It's one of the oldest houses in York region, uh, which is both a log cabin and a brick house. And the on-ramp is going to pass right by it. And the homeowners are worried that when it happens, the, the house will shake apart because all the, the lime and sand foundations, it's all been leached away. So my question is, uh, how can we in municip municipalities interface with provincial governments to prevent you know, overreach with regards to heritage houses? Uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. I know absolutely nothing about provincial government. Uh, but let, let me just say this. Um, in the first place, the type of situation that you're talking about is totally classic. I mean, th this is just happening in every community across your country and mine mm -hmm. all the time. I, I just, a little side story to this. The first time that I ever went, hmm, historic preservation, that's interesting, was uh, I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and an engineer that I worked with who had grown up in Arkansas across the river took me to see his family home. And th there was their kind of, not real fancy, but this kind of nice old farmhouse from the 1800s. And about 100 feet in front of it was a wall of earth about 60 feet high, which was the, 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 the levees that got built after the 1929 flood. And he said, that, that's my legacy. I get to look at this you know, wall of earth now. He said, but that's not the real story. The real story is that our land flooded every year. And because it flooded every year, we had new soil every year. So we could grow crops on this land and never have to use fertilizers. It, the river fertilized our, our land. And so for Arkansas, they took hundreds of thousands of acres of the best farmland and they destroyed it by flood control. So it's just the kind of thing, like I was saying about the window design, these, these things that are external to the conversation that are really significant impacts that shouldn't be external to the conversation. So I don't know anything about the particulars, but I would just say trying to find a way to have that conversation where you, where you reveal these very real impacts that are just not being considered and put numbers on them, put dollars on them, et cetera, uh, put the stories behind them too, because a lot of times the stories are the things that actually get people's attention. You know, and, and just don't, don't let these things that are external to the conversation continue to be external. Bring them into the conversation. Be holistic. Okay, thank you so much. I think that's an inspiring spot to uh, leave leave the, uh, the conversation tonight, that we need to dilate the frame both for within the heritage conservation community and the larger community in terms of what we're considering. Thank you so much, Carl, for uh, coming and bringing such a, your strong vision to, uh, to us again here today. And uh, I wanna thank also the City of Toronto, maybe I can stand. Um, the City of Toronto and uh, Heritage. There is a lectern. This feels so much better. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Mary McDonald and uh, all of her colleagues at uh, Heritage, uh, Heritage Services, uh, the Heritage Services branch here at the City of Toronto uh, City Planning, uh, for, for welcoming us and to, for facilitating this evening in this phenomenal space. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the perfect place to talk about what Carl was talking about in terms of uh, renewing and refreshing uh, older spaces in that, and the way that the crucial role that that plays uh, in the climate crisis and climate action. So thank you all very much for coming tonight uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing many of you at the, uh, the National Trust CAP and IHC conference over the next coming days. But uh, for those who are not, thanks for coming and uh, looking forward to connecting with you very soon. Thanks again to Carl Elfonte for coming so far.